guys, welcome back to the second part of my math calculator section walkthrough. This video is sponsored by Prep Scholar. Their online program helped me to score 1600 on my SAT, so I can't recommend them enough. They guarantee a 160 point increase in your score or your money back, and they give you the motivation you need to get studying with thousands of questions in their online test bank and videos going over concepts, including the math section, in depth. If you're looking for some kind of paid test prep, they are the ones that I highly recommend. Check the links in the description below for $50 off their SAT or ACT program, or check out their new tutoring services offered. Okay, let's get into things. Now, which of the following numbers is not a solution to the inequality 3x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 4x minus 3? So we could just plug all of these numbers in for x and see which one makes the inequality false. But a simpler way to do this might be just solving, because this seems like a pretty easy one to solve. Now, there are a few different rules for inequalities. Like, if you multiply or divide by a negative number, you're going to have to switch the sign around. But in this case, we don't have to do that. This is just like a simple addition subtraction one. So we can subtract both sides by a negative 3x, so we get just an x on that side, and then we can also add 3 to both sides, and then we get negative 2 is greater than or equal to x, or in other words, x is less than or equal to negative 2. So we just solved it pretty simply, and that shows us easier which one of these is wrong. So if we know x has to be less than or equal to negative 2, it can be equal to negative 2, and anything less than that is okay, so negative 1 is going to be the one that doesn't fit. And then to check this, let's just do the thing where we plug it in. So we have 3 times negative 1 minus 5 is greater than or equal to 4 times negative 1 minus 3. So negative 3 minus 5 is greater than or equal to negative 4 minus 3. Negative 8 is not not greater than or equal to negative 7. So we know that is not a solution. So we picked the correct or incorrect one in this case. So now we have another statistics problem. This one's a little weirder maybe. So based on the histogram above of the following, which is the closest to the average or the arithmetic mean number of seeds per apple. So note that this graph is called number of seeds in each of 12 apples. So our total number of apples here is 12. We don't have to like count up all these bars. So we have 12 apples, let's note that. And then we know the total number of seeds for each of the apples. Keep in mind, we're trying to find like the total number of seeds among all of these apples. We need to multiply the number of apples by the amount of seeds each one has. So like if we have two apples with three seeds each, that's gonna be a total of six seeds for this little bar. Following that pattern, five times four is 20, six times one is six. Um, 7 times 2 is 14, and 9 times 3 is 27. So if we add that up, that's the total amount of seeds in the apples all together. That's why we have our calculator for this section. Um, so we get 73 seeds total. So now to find the average seeds per apple, we can just divide the 73 seeds by the 12 apples that we have. That'll get us seeds per apple, and that is close to 6 which is one of our answer choices. All right, now we have two statistics questions in a row. I swear they like grouping them together. So a group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in. The survey data were broken down as shown in the table above. Which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all the survey respondents? So this one's kind of annoying. You kind of just have to solve what percentage each of these are of the total. And be careful to like divide by the right box. That's kind of the main way to go wrong with this one. So we're looking for females taking geometry. Um, so that box would be the female and geometry box. So it would be that, and then, so that's the amount of females taking geometry. And then we would divide that by the total number of survey respondents, since we're looking for all of the survey respondents. So that total is going to be this biggest number. So this is where you kind of have to use the calculator, um, unless you want to suffer. <laughs> okay, so that's only 17.1%-ish. You can multiply it by 100 to get like actual percent. So we get 17.1 for that. Females taking algebra 2 is going to be this box. So 62 divided by 310, that's going to be 20%. Males taking geometry, 59 divided by 310, that's going to be 19.0%. And then let's just check. Males taking algebra 1, 44 divided by 310. We already know that's going to be a lot less than 17%. Yeah, 14%. So yeah, the males taking geometry is going to be the closest number to 19. Is accurate to a few sig figs there. To check this, I would just make sure you're dividing the right boxes by each other. So take a good look at what this question is actually asking always. Like maybe it'll say which of the categories accounts for 19% of all students taking algebra 1, something like that. And then you'd have to use this total here instead of the entire total. So it's always good to read that carefully. Now for this next one, the table above lists the lengths to the nearest inch of a random sample 
of 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. Of the mean, median, and range values listed, which will change the most if the 24 inch measurement is removed from the data? My bet is probably on range, but we don't really know unless we try it because the range is gonna be the total span of all the measurements. So it'd be 24 minus eight in this case, which is 16. And if we remove that 24, then it would turn into 16 minus eight, which is only eight. So that's a difference in range of eight for this. So that's our final difference for range. Then median is probably gonna change the least because the way median is designed is to be like the mean, but it's not affected as much by outliers. We have, we have 21 brown bullhead fish here. So if we take 10 on each side, the one in the middle will be our median for this set. So if we get eight of these, seven, eight, nine, 10, and then check to see we have 10 on that side too. That is gonna be the middlemost value of this set or our median. So our median is 12 when we have the 24 data set in there. But if we take it out again, we see that one down from this, the average between 12 and 12 is still gonna be 12. And that's how you calculate median. If you have an even number, you just take the middle two values and add them together, divide by two. So the median doesn't change at all. So that's gonna be zero. So they're not gonna all change by the same amount. Now mean, this is kind of just tedious. You can add up all these samples, divide by 21, then add them up besides the 24 and divide by 20. All samples divide by 21 versus all but 24 divided by 20. So I'll do that off screen. So this is without the 24. And then if we add 24 to that, that gives us 262. We divide that one by 21. And then this one by just 20, because that doesn't include our last data set. Okay, so we see that the mean does not change that much at all. And that's kind of what we were expecting. So this one changes by like 0.5-ish. So definitely range is the one that changes the most, which makes sense. We kind of did our little check for that because at the beginning we were predicting that range would be the one that changes the most. Anyway, we have another two-part question. Now, if you watched the no calculator section, you know how much y equals mx plus b shows up. And this section is no exception. We have this linear graph. We don't even need to make it into an equation yet until this question, but we're just looking for what the C intercept represents in the graph. If this is the total cost C in dollars of renting a boat for H hours. So in this case, let's just do both of them at once. This is usually our Y axis and this is our X. So it's gonna look like this. And the C intercept is gonna be this value here. So it's five in this case. And remember that's always gonna represent like the initial amount of something. So in this case, the C axis is the total cost in dollars. And then that's over time. So this is gonna be the initial cost of renting a boat. So that's A. The C axis doesn't represent the number of boats or the hours. And the increase in cost to rent the boat for each additional hour is gonna be the slope of this line, not where we start from. So for this next part, when we're finding their relationship, we know that these two are gonna be wrong because it doesn't have this nice y-intercept there, which we know is five in this case. So all we have left to do is find the slope. And slope is just gonna be rise over run. So in this case, we go up three and over four boxes, but be so careful with this. I just made this mistake. This is only one hour, even though it's four little boxes. So be very careful with your units when doing this. So we have a rise of three dollars and then a run of one hour. So that would give us a slope of $3 per hour. So it's not gonna be B because that's three fourths. That's if you counted three up and four over, which I literally just did, but that is why checking yourself is so important. So in this case, our graph would be three H plus five equals C because our slope is three and our Y intercept is five. In double checking yourself, make sure that's a realistic value. What caught me off guard when I got the wrong answer is a boat would not cost 75 cents per hour of renting it. That is like so cheap. So C is our answer for that one. So now we have a function question. So the complete graph of the function f is shown in the xy plane above. For what value of x is the value of f of x at its minimum? So remember functions are kind of just a fancier way of saying y. Functions allow us to like draw this entire weird like, kind of piecewise function here instead of just having like a linear graph or an exponential or quadratic or something. But don't pay too much attention to like the function notation. That's, it gets a little confusing. We're just looking for what value of x is this function here, this weird squiggle thing at its minimum. And we see that y equals f of x. So we can kind of just assume it's like where y is at its minimum. So we're looking for the value of x when the y value of this function is at its minimum. So in this case, the minimum y it's gonna be right here at negative two. But be careful, don't pick that one yet because we're looking for the x value, which if we go kind of work backwards, we see that x is negative three when y is equal to negative two. So our value here would be equal to negative three. That's it for the second part of my math calculator walkthrough. Stay tuned next week for the third part. Until then, thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe 
and see you soon.